We're talking with Arlo Grafton as a part of the Nebraska Broadcasting History Project. Arlo, how did you, uh, how'd you get interested in going into um, broadcasting? Larry, back in the early, very early 1960s, I was a journalism student at Omaha University. And uh, at that time, the, the, te the two television stations in Omaha, Channel 6 and Channel 3, and I, and I think Channel 7, but I'm really familiar with Channel 6 and 3, hired a lot of students, either interns or part-time people, to get into television. I had been the editor of the paper at Omaha U, and I got a chance to go work as a news assistant with Ray Clark, who was then the anchor uh, man at Channel 6, which was WWTV then. Uh, it was a night job, and, and, that was, and I got into it, and I loved it. And the, the interesting thing, and then they let me uh, come in on weekends and work the radio desk and write the minute radio newscast. So it started at that point to get in my blood, and then I just shifted all my priorities after that toward television. And, that, and prior to graduation in uh, January 64 from Omaha University, I was, had been full-time for Channel 3, with Channel 3 for about a month. And, you know, that's uh, where I started full-time. That was uh, in December of 63. Had worked about a year or so with WW on a part-time basis. Talk about what it was like in, in those times. Well, you know, as we were talking before we came in here, this was the time, the early 60s, when videotape was introduced into television, uh, at least on a local level. It had been prior to that in other, uh, other areas, but in Channel 6, I remember they brought the old two-inch quad tape, brought it in, and they would record off the network. They weren't really ready doing commercials, but they'd record off the network. And, and to give you an idea of a time frame, Douglas Edwards was doing the CBS News then, not Walter Cronkite. This was prior to Walter Cronkite. Well, part of my job working the, with the, as a news assistant was to go in and pick pieces from the national, the early evening CBS News. Well, you know, everything you do now is done electronically and all that. Back then, videotape was actually cut with a razor blade and taped back together. So that's how you made your edits and videotape. You didn't do too many of them. Uh, but that, that, was, that was my introduction into to videotape. You know, we were using film. Film came with television in 49. But even at that time, they were still using a lot of still photographs uh, for television. Really, the, the, the bulk of their national news coverage came from, from wire photos that came on the old wire photo uh, machines and national news pictures. And they'd throw them up in the studio, throw a camera on them. And that's, that's a lot of what their national, their national coverage was. And we used Polaroids, and they would be chroma keys as backdrops over the shoulder of the newscast. We used to do that with, uh, with Steve Bell when he would do the 10 o'clock news over at, uh, at Channel 6. Uh, you know, and, and film, and we and we we get in the, uh, the and the, the interesting thing, the the fun thing, Larry, you have to understand about television at that point in time is that it was was uh, the deadlines were incredible, and you weren't dealing with 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 videotape. You you had the sophisticated system. It was film. It would come off a processor. Hopefully, it dried. Okay, hopefully it dried. Come off the processor on a big reel. You'd take it in, and you usually. Yeah, you'd be maybe 15 minutes, 10 minutes before the newscast, and you'd start going through it. We'd lay it out, it'd be five seconds, five, 10, 15, 20 seconds. And this was cut not, it. And this was not color film. Not color film. This was black and white. Color film came to Channel 7 first in about 1965, 66. The other two stations, uh, 6 and 3, in Omaha, uh, in September of 69, somewhere in there, got into color film. Yeah, a little black and white film. Easiest thing in the world to shoot. Boy, you had a lot of room <laughs> with that. You could be in a pretty dark situation, pretty bright situation, and miss a little bit and be okay. So, and that was part of it. It was a mix of a lot of everything. Of course, the, the live color studio cameras had already been introduced uh, by the early 60s. And the Channel 3 had uh, experimented them way back even in the, in the 50s. What were your responsibilities when you worked full time at Channel Three? I was a I was a reporter photographer. There was no distinction. You did both. Uh, most of the time, ninety percent of the time, we covered our news with a with a silent Bell and Howell Filmo or the old Bolex camera, sixteen mil hold hold a hundred foot reel of film, which was uh, two and a half minutes, and we'd cover our stories that way. And you'd have a notebook in your pocket, and you'd have this, and you'd usually have an extra roll of film in your pocket, and you'd be carrying a, either a frezzy light, which is a hand light, or a, an old uh, flood stand light if you were going into a room with me, and you'd light it up and, and roll off 30, 
40, 50 seconds, minutes worth of film, and you're taking notes frantically, and you go back, and, and, and in those cases, you probably went back, processed the film yourself, edited it yourself, wrote the copy, you know, you, you did it all. I mean, it wasn't, uh, uh, I mean, it was expected. The, the newscaster at that time didn't have producers and editors and all that. They would write it and, and uh, in some cases even go back and edit it. You, you mentioned this uh, without producers and so forth. Approximately how many people would be working on a newscast? Uh, the reporters and the anchor and so forth. How many people would be involved? Probably in, in the case of an evening, I still use a 10 o'clock newscast because uh, there may be three people. One of them would be an intern. One of them might be a film editor. They, I, I, maybe a little bit more. They'd have a night reporter. The early, the, the, the six o'clock newscast would be a little different because you'd have your, your full complement of day staff, but that one more than eight, ten people. And you, and in, in the case of, of, of us at Channel 3, we did have a film editor. We always had a film editor. Of six and the others, you, you did your own for the most part. How many, um, um, how would you appraise the ability to cover news and television in, in the time when people were sort of finding their way? Well, in a, a lot of respects, Larry, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat prejudiced here because I think we come from the perspective of we were objective viewers of a given event. That was our objective, was to report it from, a, from an objective point of view. And that's the way we were taught. And, and fortunately, in my case, uh, I had one of the premier teachers in, in a gentleman by the name of Mark Gutierrez, who was a news director at Channel 3, who was very much a stickler on the journalistic side. Your facts were correct, et cetera. You were objective. There was not one side. It was always both sides. So I think from that, from that we didn't go into a story prejudged on the story. We went into a story, it was a new given thing each time we went in. So we observed it from an objective point of view and reported it uh, remembering that there were both sides. And that's just the way we were taught. You mentioned Mark Otier. Talk about Mark and some of the other major figures in Omaha broadcast journalism during the 60s. Well, uh, Floyd Calvert was a big one who left in 61 to go to Chicago. But when I started Channel 3, Tom Brokaw at that time was doing the early morning news. Tom never did the weeknight 10 o'clock news. He did some weekend 10 o'clock news and he filled in sometimes. But Tom's responsibility was to do the cut-ins for the Today Show and the new news. And Tom would come in for 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and he'd have mountains of wire copy that he'd rip through and uh, uh, he'd prepare his own newscast, put his own film from the day before. He would put that all together. He was a one-man band and go down and report it on the air. Uh, we had other guys uh, that, at that time, uh, one who comes to mind is a guy named Paul Beavers who went on to be a producer for NBC News uh, in New York and, uh, and other places. And uh, we had a lot, Lee Wilson, who went on to be a photographer for NBC. We had a lot of great, I had a lot of great mentors, if you will, in, in that business. And I feel very fortunate. And, and Mark was a great mentor from just the journalistic side and the news side and and you know, recording, recording and reporting fully. You know, don't leave anything unturned. And then I had the Lee Wilsons and and uh, and, and the the Paul Beavers to kind of round out. You know, Lee was so great with the camera, and I, you know, and I always I always go by the theory: there's nothing original beyond the Book of Genesis. So I would steal good ideas. If I see a good shot, it would show up sometime later. So I had good good mentors, and, and even at, uh, at Channel 6 with, with, with the Ray Clarks and the Steve Bells, and Steve went on to be you know, a network correspondent uh, with ABC and did the Good Morning American News for a while. So I had some good people in there to, uh, to kind of lay on and, and learn from. You talked about some of the uh, silent film cameras, the uh, Bell and Howell DR-70 and the Bolex and so forth. When did sound film come as a part of television news in Omaha? Sound was there. All, all that time. It just was, was a little bit more cumbersome to use it. You know, you know, it just wasn't easy. And we just didn't, there wasn't, sound wasn't necessarily a feature. I mean, if you had a news conference, stuff like that, we do. But the, this, the sound cameras were there uh, in, in the 50s. The Oricons. The, the Oricons, the optical, they were optical sound, which they laid a, a light sensitive uh, soundtrack on it. How much of the newscast might be sound film 
given news uh, conferences and reasons for perhaps to use that? Probably from a lo or in the early six for locally, maybe 10% of it would be sound. The rest of it would be a lot of silent stories. In those stations, how many sound film gear, I mean, packages or, or um, units uh, could they feel at a time? Did they have one we or two, two or three? We had two at Channel 3, and I think they had a couple of them at... Uh, at Channel 6, and some of them were, were 100 footers. We had two and a half, and then we, then we got the, the Orcons with the magazines on, and then eventually into the CP-16s, in which we could have 400 foot a week, and the, the old real heavy Orcons, we could get 600 foot, and they had some way to put even more than that on it. And when they do documentaries there, or if they were going to shoot a like a half hour thing, they'd use the, the 1,200 footers or whatever it was. You've uh, often uh, has a reputation of being somebody who's very creative in terms of packaging materials, editing materials, uh, shooting materials, and so forth. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the changes in terms of the visualization and the editing styles that you have seen over the years in television. Well, <clears throat> initially, Larry, we did not give a whole lot of thought to the editing. I mean, if it looked good and it kind of went together, it, it was fine. We concerned ourselves more with the reporting side of it. Then we finally got into the realization, hey, we are a visual medium. Let's let it visually tell. Let's don't get in the way of the visual part of it. So then you got into that, that arena where uh, there were a lot of, uh, with the natural sound and the, and the visual part of it, and then the reporter would then insert narration where so you got in you got into that um, I always like to get involved in the in the uh, the feature aspect of news the kind of off the wall the the type of thing you don't so I like I love doing seasonal features which was a visual thing you didn't have to put a lot of words and a lot of stuff that I did that uh, that worked very well for me had no words at all it was strictly music and pictures and, and, it, uh, and, and the interesting thing is that we, we finally realized, and this happened really kind of before I got there, after you got television started in Omaha in 1949, and realized those guys came out of radio. So they were put in front of a camera like this, and they talked. That's what they were used to. Now they had to put on a tie and a coat, maybe look a little better because they were, they were being seen. But then they finally realized that, hey, we can put pictures with our talk and we can enhance what we're saying. And then they found out that, yeah, we can even record the sound of, and we can even enhance our reporting and what we're doing even more so. And now you're, you're, you're at it to the point where um, it's totally, in many cases, a visual thing. The only aspect that I don't like now is there's, in, in a lot of cases, there's a, a lot of emphasis on the reporter and that that aspect of it and, and, the, and the star thing. And sometimes I think that gets in the way of it. But my goodness, uh, to think of what the capabilities they have now of, of covering news. You and I can walk out here with a VHS camera and record a given event and boom, you know. So it's, it's really evolved. Now, and, you know, and you and I have talked, we're into computers. Uh, Stuff that I edit now is done on a, a, a PC, a Macintosh, and we deal with, uh, with images that go up on a track sheet, and we can do a, all kinds of stuff with that. And think about two, Larry, that's 49 to 95. In essence, that's where we are, 95. A relatively short period of time to see all the technology. We send satellites, we send signals, and we, we're instant in the world now. Well, one of the things that you've had um, uh, fun doing is putting together a television program which traces the history of television in Omaha. Talk about how uh, that program came about and what, what uh, went into the uh, pr production of it. A lot of people might not remember, but there was a gentleman at Channel 3 by the name of Henry Kelp. Henry Kelp was uh, kind of a, a, an all-around guy. He would do sports, weather, etc. But basically, he was a, a commercial announcer type thing and, and that. And, and one day... Oh, 83, 84, something. I was sitting at Channel 3 with Henry, and Henry was telling stories about the early days of television. The li everything was live. There wasn't, the, you know, the beauty of videotape, and it, it gets screwed up, and you do it over. You know, re-rack the tape and do it over. It was all live. And he started telling funny, funny stories of things that happened in live television. And I, and I got to thinking, you know, I, I said, Henry, I said, this would be a tragedy to not have a record of this. 
So that, thus evolved. Then I went to each of the stations and sold them on the idea of, of doing a 35-year celebration of Omaha on television, and, and it, it turned out pretty good. Because Johnny Carson, for example, let us sit down and do a half-hour interview with him, and my goodness, you know, he's synonymous with uh, Omaha on television, and, and rightfully so. What, uh, what sort of things, when you did that, surprised you about those years of television in Omaha? Because after all, you'd been around Omaha and you'd watched some of the programming before you got into it professionally. But what sort of things were uh, unique? Well, I, I think, Larry, the, the unique thing about it was how easily these people handled all of this live. I mean, they, they would start at noon and go the rest. It was all live. I mean, at Johnny Carson pointed out there were sets all around the studio, and the cameras would go from set to set to set. And, and they, uh, they had to rehearse their commercials because they didn't have teleprompters. Okay, they rehearsed their commercials. Uh, you know, they, they, I, I'm, a, I, I'm amazed at what they did under those circumstances. And, and when you talk to them, it was just their job. I think if you were to take people who are in television right now, strip them of all the taping capabilities and just put them up in front of you, and you've got to fill them out. Johnny Carson was told, for example, by Lyle DeMoss, on a Friday, that beginning the next Monday, he would do an hour a day live television. Produce it himself. He didn't have, you know, you watch these shows now, even, even, uh, even here on ETV, I watch these shows and you look at rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of people who work on a show. I, I think that's great. Johnny Carson, when he, he was by himself doing an hour. That was the way it was. So I, I marvel at these guys, how they, they took it, made it, made it a, a medium that, had a, that gained a, a great amount of respect in a, in a quick period of time. We were brought in 1952 to the national conventions. We began, our whole world began to open up that had been somewhat narrow because initially in 49 and 50, there wasn't the network all the way out to Nebraska. And Omaha was one of the furthest west points from, from there were stations out further west, but it didn't go from Omaha. Uh, so, and they didn't have the network, so they would send out what were called kinescopes, which were just merely just films taken of a television set, and they would record the, the shows as they were done live. They would ship the kinny out to stations like Channel 6 and Channel 3. That's why they broadcast Christmas shows in the end of January, February. It was all delayed. Then the network came out, and then it, it started going from there. So. When you produced this program, as I understand it, you went through a great deal of film that uh, were um, that was in some in good shape, some not in good shape, and uh, and you had to really start from ground zero and go through the uh, the archives, the files, or or whatever they happened to be. What did you find when you started the, the search? One of the things that that has kept me interested in all of this, Larry, that that came out of this is that they had recorded history immensely on film, in, from from 1949. On through, and the interesting thing is, is that even here in Lincoln, across Nebraska, when those stations were on the air in the 50s, they began covering history of this. So the second half of this century is not only recorded from news, but it's also recorded with with movie film, and that's what fascinated me. I remember Lyle DeMoss came to me, and Lyle, for a lot of people don't know, Lyle did was was a program director at, at Channel 6, but he was also a personality, and one of his uh, uh, his big things that he did a show called Lyle's Patio, which was a cooking show, which was big back then. Uh, the, the women did a lot of cooking, but Lyle did a cooking show. When I when I had put together the idea for that show and got a hold of Lyle, well, Lyle said, you know, I've got these tapes in my garage, and these tapes have been sitting in his garage now, 62 to 84, so 20 some odd years in a garage with all the weather elements and everything else. He pulled out the old, and it was black and white videotape. It, it was a two inch videotape. We took it down to Channel 6 and we had probably a half a dozen engineers tweaking the quad machine. Because the quad machines have been around, they weren't tweaked that much anymore. Anyway, tweaking the quad, and we got that, enough of that to play to where you got a feel for that, what he did. I mean, it was just, you know, it was all black and white, so you couldn't get a, you couldn't get a feel for the color of anything, Larry. And, and, when, and that's one of the reasons that a lot of people hesitated to advertise on television in those early days, because I can't, you can't see my product. You can't see the color. Well, when color television came in, Brandeis, who was a big, big store in Omaha, jumped on the 
jumped on it because now you can see the color of the sweaters, you can see the color of this, this, and this. So that's the type of thing that fascinated me. Was and, and, and also fascinated me that, that enough people had presence of mind to keep it. For example, the only thing of Johnny Carson from 1950 was a Christmas show that he did on Channel 6. And the only reason they did, they filmed it the day before so they could give those guys Christmas Day off. Somebody kept that footage of Johnny Carson. It's a half, 20 minutes, half hour show, whatever it is. I mean, it's priceless. When you think of where Johnny Carson came from and where he, where he ultimately ended up, I mean, he is, he is the persona of television in terms of, of what came out of Nebraska. So to have that, that frozen, that's what it did. It froze time. And any time that you can freeze time, preserve it in a medium that is, that is so influential and so much a part of our lives as television, then I think that's great. And I applaud any, anybody that's... And, and the, the, the interesting thing, too, Larry, and all that, is that once I got started and people knew this was going to happen, the stuff that came out of the basements, came out of the bedrooms, came out of the closets that people had. And it's just tremendous to look back. And, and they did a nice job. I was with the people over here at the State Historical Society not too long ago looking at some 50s film from Lincoln that, that, that a guy by the name of Don Wright had done at, at Channel 10. I've worked a lot of years with Don Wright. Fantastic. It froze that period in time, and you can go back, and there, it's a great for historians and documentarians. Uh, and I, you know, I applaud any effort that, where you can hang on to it and keep it. What did you find that the Omaha television stations had saved in terms of film? Uh, most of it. Other than what had been pirated out by guys like me, you know, for their own personal file. <laughs> channel 3 and Channel 6 had extensive, and Channel 7 too. It's just that nobody had really given much thought to it. It had been thrown in piles. Like I know at Channel 6 they were using ro rolls of film for door style. On cores? On cores. No, they weren't on cores. They were on big reels. Mm. Some of it was on cores, but... Uh, they're with the real that Thank you put goodness. On well, a lot of them of course, but you know and I know what happened, of course, is the middle come out and the film just kind of spread all over you to spend hours putting it back together. But it was on reels, pretty well preserved. I was amazed at how well it's been preserved and, and, and still is today because we've kind of put a, uh, the interest thing into the minds of, of the people at the television stations. Hey, don't, you know, don't get rid of this. And, and if you, when you're ready to, let us back the truck up so we can preserve it for... Uh, for future generations. How much film is it, would be in a typical news year in a television station in the 60s? I mean, that's kind of a hard question to answer and it has to go for an approximation, but talking about the amount of time that uh, that's not the newscaster or the reporter on camera, but it's the actual news film that was saved. Well, I, I guess to put it in perspective, there's uh, we usually ended up with a six or 800 foot well, what, what is an eight, a 400 was 10 minutes, so 800, 800 would be would be 20 minutes. So it'd be about for anywhere from uh, 10, uh, 15 to 20 minutes of actual film per week. Now it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you think of it in 30 second increments, it, it's quite a bit. And in some cases, if it was if it was a big it was a big week, for example. Uh, the, there's a lot of footage around the, of the 1952 floods in Omaha, that devastating flood in Omaha on the Missouri River. They kept it around. I was able to get my hands on some color footage that an MUD employee had shot in the, the 1952 floods. Stark weather, for example, and a lot of that got away, but a lot of it was pre preserved, you know, you think about in terms of, of the history. So, so from that perspective, it, it's... it's, it's um, it's fascinating to know that it has been preserved, and a lot more of it was preserved than even I had imagined. And I spent like six months or better in the basements, you know, going through the rewinds uh, and looking at footies. They had kept pretty good records, some not so good, so it was kind of a, uh, a shot in the dark. You'd grab a reel and run through it. In a lot of cases, you know, clean off the clean off the dirt that it amassed. And of course, I always think that the, that the dirt and the dust have not been too bad a preservative. <laughs> now, just as a point of clarification, this is all 16 millimeter film, right? Yes. There's yeah. no uh, 35 or eight millimeter. No, no, no the, uh, the only eight millimeter footage, Larry, would have been something that had been done by an individual, their own type thing. Uh, I did run across, for example, 
a gentleman in Omaha who uh, had a fascination for streetcars from the late 40s to the early 50s, shot streetcars on every corner that they passed in Omaha on color, Kodachrome color, and preserved it, and it's beautiful stuff. So that's the kind of thing that I got my hands on, plus pictures, plus what have you. And there were a lot of uh, things that I didn't get my hands on that people said, yeah, I have, but I don't know where it is, and it get lost over the years. But you have to remember now, too, that if you did a follow-up on a news story, you would take the film from one week and take it into the, to the next week. If you did a year-end show, if I could find a year-end show, I'd find the top stories. In a lot of cases, you know, I didn't find those. So like now, tape, you just record it, dub it, record it, dub it, and the original is back here, so you can go back to that week and you can see the original because they've dubbed from that. Back then, they would physically take them because there were very few cases. That, yeah, we, we did have a way of copying film at, at Channel 3 later on, but we didn't use it that often. And so you just, so you go back and let's say you had a major event, September 19th, 1958. So you go back to that day and there'd be a, a piece of tape there and that'd be gone. Well, they probably followed up on it a week. So you go to a week later, maybe it's a, then you try to find a year end store, uh, year end show. Maybe it'd be there. Maybe it was something they did a year later. So uh, that was the problem that I ran into, and that I want to go to a specific date and find something. And if it was a big story, it probably was gone. What stands out in your mind as you reviewed that history of Omaha television about personalities or stations or stories or commercials? What kinds of things that, and when you went through it, you said, got to put this in the show? One of the things that, that I noticed, and I'm not sure whether it got totally into the show like I wanted, is that these people in those days, particularly people on the air, didn't think of themselves as stars. I mean, it was a job. I mean, they were fascinated. They weren't paid a lot of money. I mean, I mean, they were in television, and that was the fascination of it. But they didn't think of themselves as stars. I, I, I'm sure that, you know, they would get recognized in the grocery store or the bars or wherever they'd go, but uh, they didn't think of themselves as stars. They had, they had a job to do, and, and they, had a lot, they had a lot of work to do. If you were like a Merrill Workoven or a Henry Kelp, where you were a, where, or even a Johnny Carson, where you were a staff announcer, you were doing something every hour. You didn't have breaks in there. You know, and, the, and the guys, uh, uh, the Mel Hansons and the Arnold Petersons did the farm shows, and they did all this other stuff. That, uh, so they didn't think of themselves as stars. This was just a job. You mentioned the Johnny Carson Christmas show as a priceless example of something that's been preserved. What other kinds of things did you discover looking at those films? Well, the 52 floods, for example, we, we, that goes back. The flood of Omaha. The flood of Omaha of 1952, which, is, and of course, it, was, it came down from Sioux City. The whole, it was really, a, and, and in essence, that was the flood that was really made famous by Edward R. Murrow. He came in and did, uh, did his show and talked about the heroic efforts of the people. And in essence, they saved downtown Omaha. It was a, it was a tremendous story. It was a tremendous story. Well, you have it on film. You're able to get your own perspective on it by looking at the film. It's not you and I necessarily telling our story, which is fine, but we can enhance it by actually, well, here's footage. Here's how wide it was. You can see by the pan of this camera. So that, that type of thing. And of course, the, the Starkweather thing, because as a, as a kid in high school at that time, you know, there was that. I mean, everybody was involved in that, in, in this state and, and, and nearby states. So there was then a lot of that. Plus, the period stuff, Larry, the cars, the downtown areas, the houses, the clothes, things that you don't think about, the sporting events, looking at Memorial Stadium in 1963, seeing both ends not there, a grass field in black and white, and the stands kind of not so full. Things like that, that, that you, if you can show, you and I can show a piece of film, and we don't have to say a lot, because there's, that's what fascinates me. Now you covered a period of 35 years. How much of that film that you dealt with, the perspective that you could use in the show, was color? Mm, just a little bit of it. Um, because the, what I had, had, Channel 3 had done some experimental stuff, and they shot some some color footage of their studios. That was really about the only thing. Other than I did do a, 
uh, um, I took it up into, uh, I, I did a 1971 thing when I, because I did the, the Johnny Rogers punt return out of Oklahoma with Lyle Bremser calling it because I had done a piece with Dave Blackwell who worked with him at that time. So that was a color, but that very little. The color was the was stuff we recorded, and, you know, but not the, the footage was basically black and white now and we, still pictures. Now you did, you did that show actually now a number of years ago. What's the status of the, the film holdings that, uh, that you are aware of other than the stuff that you actually pulled out yourself and put together and, and uh, have some responsibility and interest in. What about the, the things that were okay that they're still, they're still stored somewhere? Yeah, the, uh, Channel 7 has given all of its film footage to the State Historical Society. Uh, I'm working with the, uh, the Historical Society of Douglas County and the State Historical Society in putting together an arrangement to, to uh, we, we look at, and, and Channel 10's film in Lincoln is also in State Historical Society. We look at the film footage, which are the years, Larry, from 49 to uh, 75, 76, before tape came in, as really being uh, what we call collections at risk. Because um, as, as television stations change hands, chain owners, and, they, and, they, and some people, maybe younger people, is not a put down, but they don't see the value of it so much as, as you and I might. So what we're trying to do is, is go to the television stations and indicate that this, this, can we look at this as at risk. We'd like you at the point that you're ready to give up the space, that we, we've got a place for it. State Historical Society is, is set up to handle it, and then eventually the Omaha footage, when, if, if the Historical Society of Douglas County gets at a point where they can, will go back to Douglas County. But the nice thing about it is that you got it in the hands of people who are interested in it, who know the value of it and want to preserve it, and then can therefore share the value of it with people today. I, Larry, I bet you there is not a month go by that I don't get a call from a reporter at one of the three Omaha television stations saying, do you know where I can find? In a lot of cases, I can help them. I can, I can help them just, I, I, if I don't have it myself, I can kind of direct them to an area, even in their own television. And that's not any big thing on my part. It's just having spent the time going through there and being familiar with, with what's in their basements. And that's where it is, in their basements. What kind of response did you get from the television stations when that program was on? And from the audience, the the response was excellent, and I get a lot of people who even today will 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 talk about it. Be, and, and I guess the interesting thing is the, the response I got from the people who were the participants, and, and I concentrated on the people who were on the air, because I was doing a piece that was going to be shown publicly, and that's who people could relate to. For every one person that was on the air, there were ten people who you could go back and interview engineers, general managers. I did do the general manager. I had a piece of film of the general manager at Channel 6 who years ago had passed away talking about this thing called television who's gonna have, that's going to have an effect on who your life. Johnny Gillen. Hmm. Johnny Gillen and... and uh, the man with the rose and the lapel. Yeah, and was very, very well respected. By, by, by. So anyway, I concentrated on the people. And, and they were just tickled pink that anybody would even be interested and going back and letting them talk about the Don Keel, for example, who grows to be the, the president and, and chief operating officer of Coca-Cola, started on Omaha Television and was a, was a, lived across the hall from Johnny Carson down where, where the St. Joe Hospital is now. In fact, Johnny knocked on his door when, when Johnny's wife was having their first baby and said, Don, I gotta get, you got to get us to the hospital. They were real and still remain today very close friends. Don was on the air, had his own show on the air. Uh, Evolved through the business side, through butternut, and ended up all of the, that ended up with Coca-Cola through the purchases. But uh, these are the type of people that were in it, and and uh, uh, that's that's the the thing that fascinated. That is that a Johnny Carson, for example, would sit down on his Tonight Show set in Burbank and do a half-hour interview and just love talking about his Omaha experience in the early days of tell and the stories that, that, that he that he remembered and that I kind of reminded him of that I'd get from people that worked with him that were just it was just fascinating they loved it because it was fun yeah it was a job sure they didn't get paid a lot of money but they had fun you know they made a mistake they made a mistake it was, and then they made a lot of uh, go, go to great stories. We got a little time. The Johnny Carson, Mel Hanson. I don't know. 
Val Hansen did a, a farm show, a backyard type farmer show, kind of like this is on NETV, but he did a kind of studio, talked about. On Channel got, 6. On Channel 6. Well, they all had their sets. Well, you know, they, they would watch the clock and they'd get ready to go on the air. Well, then Johnny Carson snuck into the studio before he came and moved the clock ahead 10 minutes. So Mel Hansen sat down looking at the clock, thinking he was going on. So he went on the air right on now, like he would go on the air. In the background, Johnny Carson is dropping things. He's swearing. He's using all kinds. And Mel Hansen is just dying. He's live. We can't stop it and retail. He's live. He thinks he's on here. And, and this is the type of thing that, that they did back then that they had fun with. Of course, when the 10 minutes was up and he had to go on the air, actually, he was, he was like, you know, uh, uh, in a pool of water. He, he'd gone through this. Uh, Johnny Carson put a, a live chicken in Martha Bolson's uh, cupboard one time. She'd, when she was on the air, she opened my ears and pull out a live chicken. Things like that. Martha Bolson did a, a, a kitchen on all three stations in Omaha, three, six, and seven over the years. They had exercise shows. Ethel Doherty did an exercise show back in the early 50s. I mean, we, a lot of stuff that you see on television today isn't new, necessarily. It was done back then. At what juncture in that 35-year period that you particularly looked at do you, you see the changes in television to become Oh, more like it uh, is in recent times, more uh, commercial, more mature, whatever the word might be. Probably did not happen until the late 70s, until it evolved into videotape and you got the live capability. The live thing kind of changed everything. It changed, it changed the mentality, it brought the consultants into the business, it put the personality into television, and news kind of got shoved back a little bit. That was a change that, that I saw. Talk about your own um, changes in, in your own professional orientation. You spent how many years in terms of, of your responsibilities with the news department? Well, I spent uh, 20 years, 17 of them with Channel 3, the other with, with the other three with Channel 6. So I spent 20 years span from 1962 up until 82. And since 82, you've done in private production yeah, kinds of television things. television production. And you have the ability to watch all the television production, keep up with all the technology. As you look at television today and looking at the kinds of things that you've evolved over that period of time that you've been at professionally and that you've looked at historically, what, uh, what kinds of things do you see today that are really from the roots of that earlier time? Can I be honest with you? Not a whole lot unless there are some people around who come from that aspect. I'll, I'll give you an example of, of if, I, if I can get on my soapbox and let, you talk, let me talk a little bit about kind of what bothers me. Uh, the other night we had a major snowstorm in this area, okay? Uh, one of the stations went on the air with their person on camera for a minute and a half to two minutes talking about the snow. I had a ruler measured the, the, the snow and all that. And Coming from where I come from, I want the visual part of this snowstorm. I want to see the snow plows. I want to see the spinning wheels. I'm not really concerned about somebody standing in front of a camera talking about uh, it's snowing outside and, and telling me things that I think they ought to be showing me. And I think that's one of the things that bothers me now. They spend a lot of time telling me things that they could also be showing me. And there's too much emphasis on, on, uh, on the personality and not enough emphasis on using the tool as a medium to tell a story. The one thing I'm liking, there are a lot of news magazine shows that are, that are on now that are, that are getting, but they, get, they also get a little bit too tabloid for me. And I'm, I'm a little bit, I guess I'm from, from the old school and I haven't totally come into the aspect. To me, it's an objective, it's still an objective thing. It's your side, it's my side, and we're going to have them told equally. You have a lot of experience with cameras, uh, both film and tape. What, uh, in your judgment, did the tape electronic cameras do to the approach to content? Well, initially they inhibited you because they were so big. We had, but back and then the portable cameras we had were RCA TK76. I mean, they were big, bulky cameras. What year would that be? It was 76. 1976, and we had big, uh, separate three-quarter inch recorders. We didn't have the nice little compact packages that you have now to, to go and cover news. And so it was, because it was so bulky, uh, 
you didn't go down into the, the, the areas that you went into with, when you had the camera, because you had the lightweight camera. Because you remember, even when, when we went from, from the, the silent cameras to the, to the CP-16s, the CP-16 was kind of a very compact uh, film camera, and you had a lot of mobility. You could go up a ladder with it in one hand. You just, you just, so you, it inhibited you from getting the, the, what, what I call the different angle other than just the straight from the, uh, straight from the stand-up eye point of view, which isn't always... The, the angle that, that really tells the story. And, and from my perspective, I always like to look beyond that our eye to eye angle and look at it from a different perspective and see if there wasn't a different way to put on. For example, you don't necessarily, the camera, if the camera looks at a small child, for example, from my point of view, then I'm looking down. Well, what happens if I get down from the child's point of view? Look at the different perspective, that type of thing. And we, in tape, kind of inhibit. Now you can do all that. Plus, they had tubes in them, so if you put them into the light, you got a blur, and you, 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 know, you burned the tube, so you had a black spot on the tube, and it showed up on your tape until you got it out of there the next day or whatever it was. Now they're in the chip cameras, and old guys like me, they like to shoot the sun and, and things like that and shoot into lights. Now I'm back in my my element, because I can do that with a, with a chip camera, because you don't have that. So the, the, would it be fair to say that some of these kinds of things go in cycles and change, and, and if you know where the cycle was, that you can adapt to them? Yeah. The only thing that, that I am concerned with now is the, is the specialization where you have a cameraman and you have a reporter. Um, because of that, you have a technician here in most cases, and you have a reporter, and this technician is not really an arm of this reporter. He's just merely asking the reporter, well, what do you want me to get? And I always kind of like to pride myself in knowing what the story was and, and being into that story as a reporter first. Then I tell it from a reporter's perspective visually. You know, I never looked at it. I never wanted a reporter to say to me, did you get that? I want to make sure. So I got myself, and that's part of my early training, and there are a lot of people who went through that, in that you started as a reporter first, and you learned the technical side, you blended the two. Well, when it got into specialization, you still were a reporter, and you still thought from that. And now you, got, you get into specialization, a guy comes into this as strictly a cameraman, and he looks at it as strictly a cameraman, and if he doesn't have a, a, a journalistic thought or a news thing on it, He's not listening to, for example, what's being said to pick up the sound bites and that type of thing. So uh, that from, from my, I, I would much rather see uh, a guy, if you, if you want to go into the television, go into it as a reporter first. And then if you're inclined to become a cameraman, become a cameraman. But you know, there, there are no really, they, they call them photojournalists and sometimes I question whether they're photojournalists. Yeah, they're photographers or they're videographers or whatever they want to be called, but they are in, in essence video snap shooters and they're not necessarily capturing all that could be captured with a given event so that it could be portrayed as much and, and, and as objectively as it could be. You talked a little bit about the personalities. We've talked about Johnny Carson and Don Keogh. Talk a little bit about Tom Brokaw. Who were some other personalities in Omaha Television that were ones that, as you prepared the program and the, the studies that you've done, uh, stand out like those folks do, but in a different way, perhaps? Well, uh, Ray Clark, for example, who was a newscaster on Channel 6, was uh, came out of radio, and Ray had a radio audience that was phenomenal. I mean, Ray was news. And he came out of... Out of uh, Radio went into television and sat down, and he was the premier. WWW. WWTV. And then, on, and then back then, of course, they had radio and television, so he was still doing both. But uh, Ray had tremendous following. There was a Chuck Thomas, for example, the weatherman, who was, in essence, a meteorologist for the uh, Corps of Engineers. So when he went on the air, he was coming at it from a media, but he didn't have all of the stuff they have, you know, 3D satellites and all that. He actually had to go down to the Omaha airport, which is now Hippley Airfield, from 35th and Farnham, go through the weather wires there, get his stuff together, and bring it back to 35th, because it didn't come into. Then later on, the, uh, the, uh, the, fa the uh, photo, uh, wire photo machines would, would uh, 
come over with a weather map later on so they could get the highs and their lows and that type of thing. But he had to go, you know, and, and when Channel 6 first started, their news bureau was still downtown in the old Woodman of the World or down in that area. The studios were at 35th and Farm. Ray Clark would prepare his newscast down there, would fly up, leave his car with a motor running on Farnham Street, come in and do the news and have somebody go out and make sure that, you know, that his car didn't get taken away. I mean, it was, it was split like that. Floyd Calvert, for example, who did the news, he would time his newscast by, he, had a, he would go in the restroom, and he knew that from this point in the restroom to this point, if he laid the copy out, it was that many minutes. That's how he timed his newscast. From, I don't know, from the pole in this one from the, to the pole in this one, yeah, that's, and that's the way he did it. You know, it was no... It was nothing scientific about it, Larry, but it was, it was uh, I was amazed. Ray Clark could go through, and, and you remember that, and, and, and there, was, there was a newspaper wire and there was a broadcast wire with, with AP and, and UPI. The newspaper wire would be a longer version of the story. The, 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 the broadcast would be the little 30-second synopsis. Ray would grab, as he went in to go on the air, he would grab that newspaper wire story if it was one he wanted to he'd slide it into his newscast, had the ability on air, wasn't looking at a teleprompter, he was reading his copy, could pick the high points out of that on the air and read it. So that was the guy that was fascinating. And there was the, the Frank Petty, for example, did the weather opposite Chuck Thomas on Channel 3. He had a little bird that he drew, Beanie. He was the Butternut Beanie, he was sponsored by Butternut Coffee. And they would do, uh, he would draw his weather bird, the kind of cartoon thing every night. And of course, you know, the early days of Channel 7, they had a guy by the name of John Coleman who would go out on the street, stand on his head, and wear costumes and do whatever you, whatever. That was the early 60s. Uh, but there were a lot of women, Larry, in television in the beginnings. And the reason being was pretty obvious to the people who were running television. People at home during the day were housewives. They were the ones watching television. So you had cooking shows, you had uh, the talk shows, you'd have fashion shows, you'd have these type of things that were geared more toward women. And then all of a sudden, by about 58 or something, I don't know whether they got intimidated by women being on television, that kind of slid out of the way and it became more of a male-dominated medium then. But women were a big, big fact. They weren't not in news or sports, but in the, in the other cooking and all that. I mean, Martha Bolson was an institution on Omaha television. Had a following everywhere she would go. You know, and the, and the, and the, the, the Channel 3, for example, was owned, by, was owned by May Broadcasting out of Shenandoah, Iowa. In connection with the May Seed Company. They'd send their old uh, guy, Frank Field, come up and do a 10-minute commercial every noon news for crying out loud. Uh, on May Seed Nursery, but Frank had a great following, you know. What about kid shows? There were a few. There was a, a romper room in the early 60s. There were uh, uh, a guy named Rusty Sosby had a kind of a Western type show that involved some kids. Uh, uh, Uncle Tom Chase was another one that uh, were afternoon shows that were geared. There was Bozo the Clown, things like that. There were, there were a lot of those, yeah. Studio productions. Studio put it live. Bring, they'd even bring uh, kids in and have them as, uh, in a gallery and a guest. You know, there were dance shows. Even prior to uh, you know, American Bands and Dick Clark's American Band, they were doing them in the studio. Uh, the the uh, Channel 6 had a noon show, uh, the name escapes me. You know, they had a full orchestra in there. They did live. Sponsored programs, too. Sponsored program. Drift. Remember Dref, soap, things like that. You bet. Yeah, it was. It was uh, that 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 as much as anything fascinated me to have those people talk about that, and then be able to find things visually. That uh, WW Cauley was the show that I was where they had the full orchestra, which was basically a radio show put into television, and they got you know they started dressing up and. Uh, uh, the, the orchestra, they just sing and play. A guy named Al Lamb and people like that were, well, back then, were, were great, you know. And of course, and then Johnny Carson would come on. Johnny Carson did a lot of stuff. He played bridge on television. He put a camera over his shoulder. He had big card. He'd have somebody on the phone, and they would play his bridge hand. He told me, he said, on our show, he said, what I like to do he said, I like to have turtle races. He said, the reason I like to have turtle races because they took a lot of time. <laughs> He go. He would actually go out on the street on Farnham, and he pulled people in, be on the air. I mean, an hour is a long time to fill. 
their life. Yeah. Well, I, I think this is probably prior to the time that you were professionally involved, but perhaps you recall it as a viewer. I understand at one point there was a period of time when the network didn't feed something that they would actually just put a camera out the window and watch the passers-by on some of the stations. Yeah, Channel, that... Channel 3 had a remote truck that they took down to 16th and Farnham. Remember, this was in the, in the 50s when there, there wasn't the shopping malls that we know now. Downtown was alive. I mean, that was the place to be. And they put that camera up on the truck, and for a half hour, you would just shoot people. Some interesting things happened because there'd be people at home seeing husbands with different women and, and all kinds of stuff. But it was a great, uh, it was just, and they put music behind it. In fact, when it first went on the air, Larry, they, people would sit and watch the test pattern. The old round test pattern. One of the engineers at Channel 6, they found out about that, said, well, let's give them some music. So they put some music to go with the test pattern because they'd have it on for a half hour or whatever it was prior to the day's program. You've got to remember, day's programming, when it didn't start till 3 in the afternoon, it would be done at 9 o'clock at night. And, and some of those didn't even have programming on Saturday, for example. It was, it was a whole day without television program. Now, when you went at, to the vaults, um, archives, the files to find visual materials, and you've also indicated people brought them from some of their private collections. I'm not quite clear how much of this is essentially news information material, and how much of it is the feature kinds of programs, the Johnny Carson, the Martha Bolson, the commercials, those kinds of things. Mostly that, mostly the, the commercials and the Johnny Carson type thing. Because when I would do a Floyd Calber or a Brokaw, then it would be news related. And I'd go back, but I would go back into the news files because I wanted period, mm -hmm. that period. I wanted to show the streets. And then I'd look, be looking for old uh, promotion films, which would show the studio cameras, which would show the personalities on the air. Because they, re so they didn't tape, they didn't have tapes, so they didn't tape themselves, it was all live. And if somebody didn't come in and step in the studio like we are, if somebody didn't step in here with a film camera and film a little bit, there was no record of that. Or if somebody made a kinescope, and they didn't do that that often, because usually the, you know, somebody had to set it up and, and do it. So that's what I was looking for. And fortunately, in a lot of cases, I was able to find little snippets here and there that put them all together. And really, you know, the, the, the cameras in the studios. I got that, stuff like that, which we really built it because we're talking about television. How were you able to get the television stations, all of them, to cooperate on that venture? Well, I... Uh, Two of the general managers at that time, I was very good friends with Ed Zachary, who was at Channel 6, Gary Nielsen was at Channel 7. And having talked to, to Henry, and I was out, not in television news anymore at this time, I was in television production. And so I figured, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this idea, the only real hitch that I could put on it was that it was coming up on 35 years and there was some significance in 84. I could use the 35 years, 35 is a significant time. So I put together this proposal, went to Ed Zacker and said, look, you know, I said, first of all, we, the people are still around that can tell us about it. Here's the idea, let's do a 35th, and we'll include all, the, at that time, 42 wasn't there, so we just did three, six, and seven. So he said, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. And I went so, to Gary Nielsen, yeah, it's a good idea. I had two of the three. So I knew when I went to Roger Ottenbach up to Channel 3 that I got two of these guys in my, so they, they, they thought it was a great idea. Then they put together a scholarship fund, they put together a whole thing at the Orpheum Theater. Johnny Carson came in live by satellite that night from his set and did a live thing to that audience in the Orpheum Theater. And we ran the show, which uh, was a 52-minute show. And then, then, then uh, subsequently, the television station sometime later ran it, simulcast it, all three of them, well, one evening, 6.30 or so, 6.30 and 3, 6.30 and 7.30. So it, it was fascinating. But the, the nice thing about it is having done that, now that stuff is preserved. Because a lot, 10 or 11 of those people have since, uh, have since passed away. Ray Clark, for example, wanted me to come and do the interview. He was dying of cancer. He died a month later. He said, if we're going to do it, we have to sit down. He, could, he still was very coherent and his mind was there. But he was a shriveled up person. He was dying of cancer. So I was able to capture that. But looking at that Ray Clark and looking at the Ray Clark on the film that I had, was, but at least he was telling the story. There wasn't somebody telling the story for him. 
There have been, in, in more recent times, developed in other parts of the country, broadcasting museums, New York, Chicago, and so forth, and they get a, f a fair amount of public interest in that sort of thing. From your uh, perspective, what sort of things can the public get from having access to some of the materials that you've developed in, in the Omaha television history program and other materials that you know about? Well, first of all, Larry, they can see the evolution of the medium, which they take for granted now. And, and we have no idea of what the future of it's going to be. I mean, we get inklings of, you know, fiber optics and all that. That's a whole new thing. But to go back and see the, the beginnings of it and being able to have, see the old microphones, the old black and white television sets, the little screens, the big tubes, all that, to have preserved that, to be able to see where it has evolved, that plus being able to see the actual motion pictures of that time and being able to go in. And, and my ultimate dream would be to have a museum of some sort, and I and don't really care where it is, where you and I, documentarians, students, people could go in and they could check out something from a certain period of time and see a news story or see a day or see a downtown Omaha, a downtown Lincoln, be able to see it as it was then, that type of thing. If, if we don't do that, then, then we're losing an extremely valuable commodity of our history, that being the moving film and the artifacts of that area. Because the people, and, and it's interesting, and I, and, I, and I point this out in a lot of cases, it's the only industry that we're really st is still young enough that we're still able to go back and deal with some of the people who were there when it started. But a lot of them are, 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 have reached the point where they're, they're leaving too. But have, I've got about uh, 20 hours of interviews of those people that I have kept and preserved and guard them with my life because they're talking about those times. So you now you're able to fix that period in time and we can evolve it to where we are now. We've been talking with R.L. Grafton, who is a very articulate and enthusiastic spokesman for the preservation of the history of television and whose professional history in Omaha has started in 1962 and continues vigorously today, but who is a, a person we all owe a debt of gratitude for to preserving a lot of the television archives that we have at this point. Marlo, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.